This is Unsilo brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Okay, welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with uh, Bill Easterly, who is a professor of economics at NYU and also the co director of their Development Research Institute, as well as the author of a number of books in the area of, of development, um, including this one right here uh, The Tyranny of, of Experts. Um, Economists, Dictators, and the Forgotten Rights of the Poor. And then uh, before that, you wrote this one, uh, The White Man's Burden, Why the West's Efforts to Aid the Rest Have Done So Much Ill and So Little Good. And then if we want to go way back, uh, I was looking at the picture of you on the back cover, and I was like, okay, <laughs> that's, a, that's a while back. Been this while. one here, The Elusive uh, Quest for Growth, Economists' Adventures and Misadventures in the Tropics. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Greg. Good to be here. So I think, you know, the the world still is quite an unequal place, even though we've seen quite a bit of progress in, in many areas. Uh, we still have quite a bit of poverty, and there's still plenty of people in the world of economics and policy that are concerned about poverty mm -hmm. in the world and what mm -hmm. we could call under development, although I, I know you're not fond of that that term, but there's yeah. plenty of people who are thinking about these issues, uh, and we've been thinking about these issues for a long time, um, and yet it seems um, the way in which we've been thinking about them hasn't really changed all that much over the last century. We've changed the names, we've we've changed, we've stripped out some of the more offensive uh, bits of language that. Um, uh, you know, that, that might've revealed some things about what was going on, but, um, but at the end of the day, there hasn't been uh, uh, that much change. And so I was, I was wondering, first of all, if you could comment on that and then, and then secondly, um, talk about how you spent 16 years at the world bank. Uh, and yet you're, you're very, very critical of the world bank and the development institutions out there. Uh, and, uh, and I was wondering how did you come to the position that you have? Did did you come to it through experience uh, working with the large multi multinational institutions, or or did you kind of go in uh, as as sort of you know um, uh, you know into the belly of the beast with with a with a different perspective uh, from day one? No, uh, no, not from day one. I think um, you know I was very grateful to have the chance to work at the World Bank, and I I still am in retrospect. I thought it was a, a very good place to work in many, many ways, the world's best and largest concentration of economists working on development. Uh, I guess what happened is, as I uh, compared what we were supposed to be achieving with what we were actually achieving over time, and this took me quite a while, uh, I became kind of uh, disappointed in what we were, how, how much our accomplishments were falling short of our, our rhetoric that we're supposed to be promoting economic growth, especially in, in the poorest parts of the world, like uh, parts of Latin America and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And yet growth was not happening in those places. Uh, the policy reforms you're recommending did not, either did not happen at all, or if they did happen, they had disappointing results. And then I also worked at, uh, toward the end of my time at the World Bank, uh, quite a bit on Russia. And that was kind of another eye opener because, you know, we went into Russia in the early nineties after the fall of the Soviet Union with a lot of hope and expectation. We, you know, we all thought though they can sort of instantly adopt institutions of capitalism and democracy and this place will be flourishing in no time whatsoever. <laughs> kind of naively thought that and we did this sort of shock therapy approach of trying to recommend they change everything at once. And then what resulted was actually one of the greatest depressions in economic history and enormous inflation and, uh, you know, the collapse of any democratic experiment. And so that was also really an, an eye opener. So I guess, so disappointments on three continents, especially Latin America, Africa, and Russia was sort of enough to make me re-examine things as, as many other people were also. Now in the book, um, the white man's burden, you uh, make this distinction between kind of planners and, and searchers. Uh, and then in the, in the tyranny of experts, right, you, you really kind of um, highlight what you think the key 
delusion is, and it has to do with this notion that there is sort of a big plan um, and a master plan uh, that will, mm -hmm. uh, a top-down plan that will ultimately solve a lot of the problems that we're concerned about. Um, mm -hmm. Now, isn't this just sort of a rehashing of the kind of markets versus states dichotomy that we've seen in economics for a long time? Aren't, isn't this just a position where, you know, markets solve all problems and, you know, as Ronald Reagan said, the, you know, the government's the enemy, you know, I think critics of your position might say that. How do you, how do you respond to that? Uh, well, you know, that, that is an important debate, um, but in some ways it's sort of the wrong debate, I think, in, in development, because I think what we really want is, of course, we want both good, we want high quality private goods and public goods both. And so the plan, the planning approach really is trying to do top-down provision of both public goods and private goods, meaning for the public goods, like infrastructure or schools, you know, the experts already know what the answer is. They just, well, hand in their blueprint and the government executes it. And that's supposed to bring development. And then the, on the private goods, there's also a lot of planning rather than reliance on markets. So I think the key distinction is actually more sort of bottom-up decentralized feedback versus top-down planning, which applies both to public goods and private goods. So for public goods, the crucial thing we need is political freedom so that citizens can reject or modify the low-quality public goods that the government may be offering. Or, you know, also protest if the government is actually doing harm to them, if the government is actually expropriating their property or putting them in jail for political beliefs, you know, that's actually doing harm to them. So it's, yeah, on the public good side, you really need some kind of democratic mechanism where the citizens can give feedback and hold the government accountable for what it's doing to them or for them. And that is necessary in order to get high quality public goods. So it's really... The, the debate really should be freedom in both political and economic senses versus authoritarianism, which just tries to impose, impose the top-down vision authority, in an authoritarian manner coercively with, without giving either the customers and markets or the citizens and democracies any choice. That is when a lot of harm is done by, by governments on both private goods and public goods. Well, you, you point out that the... Um... Uh, the folks who um, are working at, say, the World Bank and other large institutions are are careful to avoid um, making policy proposals that could be interpreted as as political, right? They 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 want to focus on kind of what works, uh, and this means that they avoid terms like democracy and and so forth. Um, and I think you know among economists, economists like to emphasize the the positive, and they like to stay away from uh, the, the normative. Um, and, and so when, when you come out and advocate for say individual rights and, and democracy and so forth, are, are you doing this, um, uh, are you advocating these things as ends in themselves or are you advocating them as kind of a means to these development goals, uh, means to, to greater prosperity and, and, uh, greater, uh, what we might call development. Yeah, well, really both both positive and normative. Uh, I think rights are an end in themselves, that people want freedom. They, they do not like being coerced or oppressed by governments in and of itself. You know, I think uh, every one of us around the world would like the right not to be tortured or imprisoned for uh, what we are doing. So I think that's a fairly universal, uh, universally understandable value. And it'd be very hard to uh, kind of ignore the normative aspect altogether. You know, I think, you know, I do, I do realize very much that economists are very uncomfortable with the normative discussion, that we would rather just stick to the positive. But, you know, trying to, com trying to claim that the positive is the only dimension really does wind up sort of being normative through the back door. If we really say, you know, we just want to know how we can raise GDP, then that's, that's just a positive recommendation. Well, you know, we're making implicitly a normative judgment that GDP is all that matters. So that if if GDP is raised in a coercive, oppressive manner, we're saying that's good, you know, normatively. And of course, it, it, we we would be uncomfortable with that once that that is pointed out. It really isn't good. If you know, if GDP in Uganda is being 
increased by uh, the government coming in with guns and expropriating farmers from their own land and turning the land over to some other high, higher productivity user, that does raise, raise GDP. But I think, you know, we would all feel uncomfortable as being raised in a, such a, a brutal, violent, coercive manner. And I think economists for, you know, since Adam Smith, we do recognize a very important role for the idea that the individual should have the right to consent to what is happening to them, that the individual choice is something that's an end in itself and should guide our normative judgments. So if we are forcing something on, uh, on poor people, then implicitly we, the, the, the realization that we need to force them to do it uh, kind of is a clue that, that, that if they don't want it, they, they apparently think it's not good for them and we should respect their choice. We shouldn't just force something on them. We shouldn't force Ugandan farmers to give up their land for the sake of higher GDP produced by somebody else. You know, they know it's not good for them. We, we need to respect that choice. They're, we need to respect their, their, what they're freely expressing as their, their opposition, that they have not chosen what we are offering. So are you saying that, that kind of raising GDP is really the, the, the shared goal of all people in, in kind of the world of development? It's, it's an unquestioned shared goal or is, is it just, a, it's a shared goal that, that, um, you know, it's just because it's the, it's the common thing that we can all agree on, or is it, is it, is it something that's explicitly mandated by, uh, the founding documents of, of these en entities? Uh, well, I think the. The founding documents do really emphasize sort of this technocratic idea that the, the development can be very objectively measured and that we've fallen on, on something like a GDP per capita is the most kind of common objective measurement of development, which is sort of like implicitly saying that we don't need to consult people on what they want. We just observe that they have higher income. And so we conclude that, that even if we force them to have higher income, it must be good for them. Yeah, you kind of think of an analogy with our, our, our own lives at an individual level. Now, it's certainly true that uh, all of us could have higher incomes by working 80 hours a week instead of what we are working now if we were increased our work hours. So, and somebody who came in, an outside expert who came in saying, wow, if you just increased your work hours to 80 hours in a week, you would ob objectively raise your material income. And, you know, I know that's so good for you that I'm going to force you to do that. I'm going to force you to work 80 hours a week. And, you know, the material indicator will show, yeah, that works. <laughs> mm -hmm. It works. So if somebody to force me to increase my work hours. But, you know, I, apparently I wasn't choosing to, to do that already. I'm only at 75 hours a week my, myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wasn't choosing voluntarily to do that already, which reveals that, you know, I didn't think that was good for me. So, you know, I was rejecting something that objectively looked like an improvement because I, you know, also had a demand for leisure and I wanted to, you know, have the right to say how much I wanted to work and how much leisure I wanted to have. So not, there is no objective measure that ever gets an outsider, outside expert or technocrat the, the ability to come in and say, I know this is going to be good for you if you just show me an objective measurable improvement on something like GDP or income. Well, this seems like a problem that's broader than just development economics, right? I mean, this seems like all oh, of yeah. economics is kind of in the same, same difficult yeah. Uh, yeah, place, right? I mean, is, yeah. I mean, this is, you know, why we need welfare economics and there, there used to be much more emphasis on welfare economics. And I think we've sort of lost, lost some of that in the whole profession, not only in development. So, so development economics then is not sort of separate. One of the things that I think you, you allude to in your books is that you know, this idea that, that development economics is, uh, you know, its own discipline that's completely removed from kind of economics in general, that there's different kind of different mm -hmm. rules that, that apply to, um, you know, what we now call emerging markets. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe some of the general principles of economics are, are forgotten. Um, you know, why is there this separate discipline? I mean, obviously people have to specialize, but, but is there really anything different about say poor countries than, than rich countries? Uh, are there different rules? Are there different, um, insights? Are there different inferences that we, that we can make? Or is there, should we be trying to have kind of a, uh, a general theory of, um, welfare, a general theory of, of growth, a general theory of, of, of kind of, you know, optimal policies? Yeah, well, there's very, you know, for a very long time been this tension on whether development should be a separate field or not. You know, I remember um, uh, a long time ago when 
uh, in the National Bureau of Economic Research, there was no development field. And the reason um, the NBR directors gave for that was, you know, we 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 think the same economics should apply in poor countries and rich countries. Why do we need a separate development field? I kind of sympathized with that. And I, I've seen that kind of revolve around the issue of like, do, do poor people really behave differently mm -hmm. from rich people? You know, are they less sensitive to, to prices when they decide what to do? You know, they're less responsive to, uh, you know, supply more when prices are high to demand less when prices are high or, or do they behave in that sort of rational way? And I think when uh, behavioral economics has been applied a lot in development, we've started to question whether, of course, there's a lot of questioning whether rich people are rational too, mm -hmm. but I think historically there has been even much more questioning whether poor people are rational. And so it seems if you think poor people are more irrational than rich people, it raises a big, a big opening for experts to come in and tell poor people what to do for their own good. So, you know, that's, that's sort of the issue around, around which the whole thing revolves. And there's no easy answer to that, but on the whole, I, 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 and you know, many, many other people historically in, in economics have sort of rejected the, the idea that there's any systematic difference in individuals between rich people and poor people, that there's a sort of analytical equality that we can understand behavior of individuals by, by looking at things like incentives and prices and. And we don't need, you know, to assume or uh, exposit a model in which poor people are intrinsically different from rich people. We can explain why they are poor because of what has happened with institutions and incentives. Well, I mean, you, you sound that's that's very diplomatic. You sound very nice. I mean, but you know, in the book, I think you're you're pretty harsh. I mean, you're 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 saying that um, the the term, you know, back when people talked about savages now, now we talk about um you know under development and back when people talked about the civilizing mission now mm -hmm. now you talk about kind of the the development mission and, mm -hmm. and you argue that there's some some there's a lot of continuities there uh and you kind of walk through the history of how yeah. kind of development economics arose as a way of kind of i don't know whitewashing the 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 colonial mission um you know, maybe could you could you just kind of walk us through that that story um, and uh, and and you know the 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 kind of dirty laundry and the birth of of the development field. Yeah, well, there's this sort of mythology that development started from scratch at the time of uh, independence of former colonies, and that uh, the historical record just says that is definitely not not true. The uh, development, the idea of development, had been around for you know a very long time, and had been used to really justify colonialism. You know that the the big justification for colonialism was you know we we rich white people are are the agents of development. You know we're going to develop you for your own good. You're not capable of developing yourself, and that gave us a rationale for conquering. Uh, other places who who needed us to support, allegedly needed us to develop them. And, uh, you know, occupying them, even taking land away from them, like we did with Native Americans, because we allegedly could develop the land better and that somehow gave us a right to their land. So that, you know, I think we do need to confront that, that history. I don't want to use that as some kind of smear on present development economics. I just want us to be aware of that history. And when, if the more we are aware of it, the more we would be conscious of, you know, to what extent have any of those ideas sort of remained in a kind of dangerous form in the present, is there still some kind of a paternalism and hidden sense of superiority, hidden sense of, uh, you know, we need to force something on these poor people that we know better than they do what is in their own good. You know, I think, you know, the, the historical record allows us to be very sensitive to those, those questions. Mm -hmm. And so you, you highlight, I think what you call these, these three aspects of the technocratic illusion and and the f the first one is is really this idea of the the blank slate right that mm -hmm. um you can go in and pretty much treat every individual society or or country as uh more or less similar to to the others and mm -hmm. and you know i trained as as an economic historian and i think as an economic historian you're you're kind of torn because when you study history at some level you know, every situation is unique 
uh, and every trajectory is unique and every mm-hmm. single country is, and region is sort of a, you know, a, a, uh, has its own, you know, individual history, but, but, but then, you know, you can't really make any kind of general claims. And so economists are the ones that are looking for, for general claims, uh, mm-hmm. and general mm-hmm. rules. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, by delving too much into, into history, don't you run, run the risk of kind of losing sight of general principles of what works and what, what doesn't work? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the problem with the blank slate is that you 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 have such a complete neglect of anything that it, you're, you're thinking of de- de- poor people or less developed countries as just being like a big zero that you come in and you supply everything that you know, all the elements of development you just supply for the first time from scratch. And if that's your mindset, you know, that also gives you a a rationale for a kind of brutal level of authoritarian control, which again, you know, went went back to the idea of kind of colonial authoritarianism that was justified by, you know, these these people have nothing, they need everything from us. You know, we should have absolute unlimited power to to do everything for them. That's sort of where the blank slate mentality leads you. Whereas, you know, acknowledging where people are at and where what they really are they? They're not nullities. They, they have very rich. Poor people have very rich culture and history, and respecting that, I think, uh, you know, allows us as, as development people to understand that development is only one dimension of the picture. This income per capita is only one dimension of the picture. There's a lot more going on, and we don't have a right to come in and tell someone else how to reorder their whole country or their whole, their whole culture just because. We allegedly know what uh, what things are compatible with development, and they don't. So that's that. I think is the danger of the, the blank slate. Now, of course, there there really are general principles. I I I, I very much agree with most economists that you know f- fundamentals like you know incentives and supply and demand and uh, budget constraints and all the you know people respond to incentives and make their choices to find their their best outcome within a budget constraint. You know, I think, I think that model is, uh, those general principles are very widely applicable to most situations, but they will usually give you much different answers when you take into account where people start from. Now you, you talk a lot about, um, Friedrich Hayek in, um, in the book, uh, and especially the part about knowledge and implicit knowledge and tacit knowledge and kind of decentralized uh, knowledge and mm-hmm. talk about kind of the, the planner's fallacy and the technocrat in the kind of illusion of, of technocracy. But, mm-hmm. but isn't that really an, an argument? Um, I mean, some people might interpret that as, uh, Hey, if you're an expert, you got to just throw up your hands because there's really nothing you can learn. But, but isn't it really more an argument in favor of, Hey, this is really complex. Uh, if you're going to be an expert, that just means you have to, you know, learn a whole heck of a lot more. You have to be, be humble enough to realize that this is a, a difficult thing rather than e- an easy thing. Well, you know, there really is a genuine role for expertise. Uh, I'm not, I'm not claiming there is, there isn't. Uh, it's more, I think the, the critical dimension is that the, is, is the expert sort of responding to the demands of the people that he is, he or she is supposed to be serving. So, you know, I, if we think of ourselves, you know, we all in our, in, our own lives have demands for expertise, for medical expertise, for plumbing expertise, for financial expertise. And we, we hire experts who can do those things for us because we recognize their expertise. I think that's, that's the, the right mindset is like, I, as an expert, I will try to find some specialized knowledge that I think is, is useful to people who then I will give the right to accept or reject my expert and expertise and voluntarily choose whether they want it or not. So I I think that's the crucial dimension on expertise. It's not, it's whether the expertise is voluntarily chosen by people who find that they, who find it useful for their own lives. And that kind of forces us as experts to make ourselves useful and not have this kind of arrogance and hubris that we, we so much better, we know so much better than other people, what is good for them, that we don't have to listen to them. We're just going to force everything on them. So what would that look like to be an expert? I mean, if, if, you know, you talk about a kind of spontaneous order and, and, um, 
you know, decentralized solutions and, um, uh, you know, letting people kind of muddle through and figure things out on their own, then, then what is the role of the kind of development expert? How, how should, if, if we're going to have institutions like, uh, the world bank, um, how, how should they be thinking of what kind of expertise should they be trying to acquire, um, so that they can in fact help? I mean, should they just give up on the process of, of helping or just get out of the way and, and let things evolve organically? Or, uh, are there some concrete things that, that development experts can do to kind of help jumpstart an improvement in welfare? Um, so I think, again, we should distinguish between private goods and public goods on this. So I think on private goods, uh, oftentimes the answer is just get out of, get out of the way. On public goods, not, not necessarily, but on, on private goods, take something like, um, you know, the idea that, uh, the poor people need, need broadband access as the key to getting out of poverty, which is a very popular idea. Now, now actually part of the infrastructure initiative in the, in the U S also. And, uh, and you know, the history of that in development has been, that has not been a great success as something useful in development. One study in India found that when broadband came on into villages in India, the main effect was just young men started playing a lot of video games <laughs> when they got broadband. And uh, an example that's kind of the, sort of the opposite of that is to everyone's surprise, poor people in Africa started to find very basic primitive cell phones incredibly useful. So cell phone usage, even by very poor people in Africa, suddenly exploded over the last about 10 or 15 years ago and has continued to explode since then. And cell phones have been, you know, far more useful than broadband to poor people. They, they use it to, they can use it for financial transactions. They use, farmers can use it for information on prices of inputs or, or where they can market their crops most advantageously. Fisherman, fishermen can use it as uh, as they flow and Abigail ben, Energy showed in a study can use cell phones to find out which beach they, they land on, where there's going to be the most demand for their fish. You know, all, all of those things were not really anticipated by any expert ahead of time. That was just something that the poor people in the market sort of voted for what they found to be useful. They did not find broadband to be so useful. They did find, you know, primitive cell phones to be very useful. And if you travel in, in Africa, then you, you will see, you know, sort of on every street corner, a little kiosk selling, you know, very small increments of minutes for cell phones to kind of confirm just how much this is really reaching very far down the income distribution to very poor people. So that's, that's an example where I think experts just really need to get out and get mostly get out of the way on private goods and public goods, you know, there, of course, uh, public goods often involved some government expertise, just like we've been relying on, you know, public health experts to get through the COVID pandemic. There's, you know, definitely a role for government experts to, to kind of tell us what is, what are good health programs that will help the whole population that do vaccination programs that, that spread medical knowledge that is really useful to everyone. Those are pure public goods and it's definitely a role for expertise and those goods. But again, there still has to be some accountability of the experts to the citizens. So if, if the experts are doing something that is just crazy that the citizens don't want, uh, there should be some mechanism that the citizens can vote with their feet or with their votes to reject what the experts are offering and choose different experts that are giving them what they want. So, you know, that might be, uh, you know, that actually could be a, a big mechanism by which better quality public goods are delivered that, uh, people are protesting if the no the health government health workers are not showing up the health clinics they're protesting and complaining and calling their parliamentarian and then that will be a strong incentive to correct those problems or if the the government is offering some some kind of uh, good that they do not want then they they have a mechanism for for complaining and so again the question comes down to it's not so much again not government versus markets it's more both governments and private suppliers have to be accountable to the people they are supposedly serving. Well, how do you enforce this accountability, right? So, um, you know, critics of uh, foreign aid say that foreign aid strengthens the the states that uh, receive this this foreign aid. But but you know, don't we need strong states uh, in order to 
enforce the rules to not only generate public goods, but also provide the infrastructure that allows for the, the markets to provide the private goods. Um, you, you walk through kind of the history of, of kind of European states and, uh, you know, it's the states that were strongest that managed to like the English state that, that, you know, managed to ultimately be the most democratic. Um, what, what, are we thinking about it wrong? We think about kind of strong states and equating them with autocracy. Um, uh, is there a difference? How do we strengthen the state without kind of strengthening the, the autocrats? Well, that's, that's a great question. There's not, of course, no easy answer to that, but I, I think what you're, what you're suggesting, I think is correct, that there's, we should distinguish between state capacity, which is just the state's ability to do anything <laughs> and, uh, and the level of democracy. So capacity and democracy are different things. You could have an uh, ineffective democratic state, which should not not be very happy. But you then so what we really want is a capable state that is democratically accountable to the citizens, but is indeed capable of delivering things when the citizens want them to. What we don't want is a capable autocratic state who will then use their capability to oppress and and deny the citizens what they, what they most want, but what is in the interest of the rulers to perpetuate their own power. So I think the complaint about aid to autocrats is that aid to autocrats perpetuates autocrats longer, staying longer in power because it disconnects them from any need to raise tax revenue from their own citizens. They can get the, all this money from foreigners and then be unaccountable to their own citizens. And so you, you say that the development experts are somewhat infatuated with the kind of benevolent autocrat. Um, is, is this yeah. based on bad empirics or is this just sort of a, um, a wishful thinking? Yeah, well, I'm, certainly it is obviously true that some autocratic regimes have had very high economic growth. And, uh, but the, the problem with that is there are also autocratic regimes that have had disastrous economic growth. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, you have to realize that with, if you, if you think you're getting very high growth with an autocrat, you may just as well wind up with a very disastrous growth. You may think that you have a Lee Kuan Yew when you really have a, a Joseph Mobutu. And so that's, that's sort of fallacy number one about benevolent autocrats. And then I think fallacy number two is we're giving, even for that difference, even then we're still giving the good autocrats too much of the credit for growth. Yeah, I think the empirical evidence shows that a lot of the, the growth variation in, in low-income states is having to do with things like whether the, the, the state, whether the, the government and the population are rapidly adopting foreign technology or not, and thus re realizing a great potential for technological catching up. That's often as the real source of high growth rather than the alleged benefits of an authoritarian leader. And also, we're also very much neglecting the role of just random events and, uh, you know, autocrats that have high or low growth rates. There's a very large random component to that. People don't, are not fully aware just in how incredibly volatile growth is. And so with such a volatile growth, it's quite possible that a lot of what look like high growth just happens by chance. And, you know, it's being driven by random events like commodity price increases or measurement error or you know, recovering from a war or things like that, that have nothing, nothing to do with the quality of the leader. So how would you structure some kind of, um, conditional aid to try to encourage the things that you think are most likely to lead to welfare improvements? Well, I, first of all, I don't, I don't think you can actually use aid as a lever to try to make governments more democratic or more you know, more free or, or less oppressive than they are. I think that has been tried and hasn't really worked. And, uh, you know, that, that might be a reason people just don't want to talk about the issue of democracy at all, because they know of no way in which aid can, can fix it. And I think that's mostly correct. And I certainly don't want us to go, you know, invade, invade the country like we did in Iraq or Afghanistan to try to supposedly imposed democracy by at the point of a bayonet by force. But what about all the, so, what about all the assistance that was given, say, prior to uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union to build, you know, uh, 
social capital, right? To to help encourage the formation of of different groups like unions and and so forth to create these counterbalances to state power, right? I mean, if if even if you're an autocrat, right? Yeah, you if if there are entities out there that you have to negotiate with to um, you know, procure tax revenue, then you're going to you know, you're going to have to negotiate with them. In fact, you, you kind of go through in part of your book, you you go through this whole uh, description about how um, oftentimes we give credit to autocrats for improving things when in fact it's really something that they're more or less forced to do by the bargaining power of civil society. Um, are, are there ways that we can kind of kind of strengthen civil society to, to kind of drag the autocrats along? Uh, so possibly there is. Uh, if there is that scope, it's probably pretty modest. That, that, uh, outside aid could modestly strengthen civil society or, or give give aid to um, you know NGOs that might put pressure on the government to do be- better things. I think it's hard to imagine that there's outside aid can do that in kind of any kind of large scale dr- drastic way because. Why would the autocrat allow that to happen? <laughs> Why would the autocrat allow uh, outside aid to come in and basically finance a sort of overthrow of his own re- of his own regime by outside actors? I think the autocrat is more likely to do what they often, in fact, have done in places like Russia or Ethiopia. Is just say, um, you know, these evil foreigners are trying to meddle in our own affairs. Let's just tell them they they can't come in an appeal to nationalism, which often works effectively as an appeal. So I, you know, I, I hate to sound so pessimistic. I just, I just don't have a lot of faith in uh, the ability of outsiders to kind of like overthrow <laughs> or undermine, you know, a, a domestic tyrant effectively to have the knowledge or the power to do that. You know, I have much more faith in kind of homegrown democratic activists. I think sort of the best thing that we can do as aid actors is, first of all, just intellectually give them the recognition that, yes, we agree that uh, a tyrannical leader is undermining the development of Ethiopia, not, not, fa- not promoting the development of Ethiopia and undermining Uganda, undermining Rwanda. Not, not, it's not a positive force, it's a negative force. And then we give sort of intellectual support and encouragement to the homegrown upon us of authoritarian rule. They don't have such a discouraging experience seeing foreigners come in and praise their own oppressor. So I think that's that kind of morale booster is, is a very intangible thing that I think is, is much more important than, than we think it is. And I think the other thing we can do is just be discriminating about where the aid goes. There is really no reason to give aid to a brutal authoritarian ruler. You know, if you think, well, the poor people living under that ruler des- deserve help, I agree they deserve help, but the the help is probably not going to reach them if they're uh, if the the authoritarian ruler has the ability to use the aid for their own political patronage, as, as indeed has been documented to happen in places like Ethiopia, where where aid donors' investigations and investigations by Human Rights Watch found that food aid was being manipulated by the authoritarian government to go to their own supporters and, and it was denied to opposition members. So, you know, we don't want aid to be manipulated in that way by authoritarian rulers. So the answer is just don't give aid to authoritarian rulers, give it to, you know, inject aid into places where there already is a democratic government that can just use the resources in a benevolent, accountable way to its own citizens. Mm-hmm. And there's other ways of kind of directing funds to the people who can most uh, best to use them. And, and, and I think one area, one movement is what we think of now as social venture. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about, you know, what you're seeing in in that area, right? Because, um, you know, this is definitely more of a bottom up approach rather than having these huge, uh, initiatives to say, solve the sanitation problem. We're, um, enabling people on the ground to potentially even earn, profits from solving these mm-hmm. problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, uh, definitely the attempt to use use the market as a mechanism to get, us, get feedback on what poor people want is, is good. So if you have a social marketing uh, kind of initiative that uh, that even if you have poor people pay a few pennies for something like a, a malaria bed net or a, a medication that is a private good like antibiotics, um, 
you know, at least you allow the market to work that you get feedback from who really wants the good you are offering and you get some financing available to pay for the pay for that good that you're supplying. So that seems that seems like a, a win win opportunity there to use use markets as a mechanism for getting feedback from the consumers on whether you're really reaching them, whether they really want your whether you're offering. So the historian me the historian in me really enjoyed the the stories about um, the different trajectories of of countries. Um, my favorite story there had to do with how um, events that went back all the way to Frederick Barbarossa can can predict organ donation rates in Italy in you know in the present, right? A thousand years later. Um, uh, what is? Can you tell us a bit about the the social capital, the importance of social capital, and and you know how does social capital uh, get get created? Um, if we wanted to have something like self independent cities, corporate entities, like the ones that developed in, in Northern Italy, is, is there a way that we could, we could do that is, is kind of, is there a way to emphasize the, uh, the, the formation of these collectivities that can build out some social trust? Yeah. I mean, I think what, um. What th- those kind of long-run studies show is that historical events can very much affect cultural variables like the level of trust between citizens, the level to which uh, people think that other people can be trusted and thus uh, make possible a lot of you know, pro-social behavior like uh, you know, being willing to give organ donations to, uh, to perfect strangers, being willing to commit in advance to donate organs to perfect strangers. And that's a sort of a good indicator of that kind of, uh, you know, society in which you, you don't have this sort of insider outsider distinction, which is, I think what happens with authoritarian institutions that you have some group that's in power that oppresses the out groups. And then the, you know, the, everyone in that society learns to distrust everyone else and think of, uh, you know, collapses on kind of using your own family or kin as your only source of survival. And in that world, you don't have a lot of trust between, uh, you know, you don't trust strangers in that world. So an authoritarian event like the conquering by Frederick Barbarossa of some cities, but not others in in northern Italy can affect the level of trust between citizens and strangers, you know, centuries, centuries later, because these cultural values tend to persist as, as parents teach their children, oh, you can't trust strangers, or yes, you can trust strangers. You know, parents pass these values on to their, their children, so they last a long time. Similarly, the, there's a great study by uh, Nathan Nunn and Leonard Wanchikon in, in Africa that finds that groups victimized by the slave trade today are much less trusting of strangers than our uh, groups that were not victimized by the slave traders. And that, that obviously kind of makes sense in the context where, you know, slaves were kidnapped by strangers and had horrible things happen to them. So of course you don't trust strangers and then uh, the mistrust gets perpetuated down the generations again. So that, that's definitely an important determinant of development because trust is so important for making possible a lot of the elementary economic transactions that we need to have happen to realize the benefits of you know, gains from trade and division of labor and gains from specialization. All, that, all of them require being able to do kind of trusting transactions between strangers and that's going to be a lot easier when you have trust and very difficult when you don't have trust. Well, you distinguish between kind of the, the, the trust between strangers and the, and the trust between members of, um, you know, say a, a clan or, or a tribe or, or an ethnic group. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, on the one hand, you say that it's, it's, it's much better to have this more generalized trust than this, this localized trust. But, but then you also tell some stories about how this, this localized trust can really be harnessed to, to, to mm-hmm. build out the development of at least some mm-hmm. portion of, of the community. So, you mm-hmm. know, you talk about the Fujianese and you talk about the, the Senegalese mm-hmm. and, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Maghribis back in, in the mm-hmm. middle ages. Mm-hmm. Um, can, can we look at those, um, institutions as, as allies or, or as, as obstacles in, in the, in the world of development? Yeah. I mean, I think sort of, uh, trust between Trust within the ethnic group is better than no trust at all, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but not as good as generalized trust. So we want to kind of have not a you know 
uh, sort of black and white picture, but more of a kind of picture of stages that uh, having at least having trust within the ethnic group makes possible a lot of transactions within the ethnic group. And that at least allows you to build trading networks and investment networks within the ethnic group, which is certainly better than nothing. Uh, but it, it still does prevent you from expanding to your your network to the whole population and choosing you know perfect strangers as partners, which is what becomes more possible when you have more generalized trust. So you know, trust within the ethnic group can achieve some pretty remarkable things, like. Uh, you know, the Senegalese that you mentioned uh, is a, a group called the Maurids that have sort of taken over street level retailing in, in a lot of major Western cities, including New York, where I live. And you, you see, you know, Maurids on the street with tables selling electronic goods or, uh, you know, designer knockoffs, <laughs> stuff like this. And um, the reason Maurids sort of have dominated this field is because they are able to you know, they have this informal level of trust within Maurids that they can use Maurids back in Senegal as suppliers and, and investors and they, these networks. They can trust each other to do these transactions within New York to, that are necessary to set up the, the tables on the sidewalk. And that, that has allowed them to kind of take over that, that whole sector because of the high level of trust they have within the group. Uh, it, it does not give access as much access uh, of more reads to kind of breaking out into other sectors or, or, you know, taking advantage of the whole set of opportunities in the, in the broader economy of Western cities that they would have had if they had, had the kind of cultural background that would allow them to trust strangers outside the group more. So it's a kind of halfway good thing, but then that kind of doesn't give you the full upside of what you can have with generalized trust. Now, when someone migrates from, say, Senegal to the United States, I mean, that, that, that clearly makes that individual Senegalese person better off. But, but you say that development economists have kind of a dim view of, of this kind of migration, that, that they would see this as a, as a loss for, for Senegal. They would see this as a, as a brain drain uh, and therefore you yeah. know, something to be discouraged. Um, you, you argue yeah. that it should be encouraged, uh, the, the free movement of, of labor. Yeah, I think as development economists, we have somehow evolved into having this kind of irrational attachment to the development of nation, nation states as the, the thing that we want to, the only thing we want to focus on when we talk about development. So we're really sort of implying that what we care about is the development of a piece of land called Senegal. And I think what we should be caring about is that all the people that live on that land, all the Senegalese, instead of just the territory of Senegal. And so if some Senegalese get out of poverty by migrating from Senegal to the U.S., there's no reason to, to exclude that from the calculation of what works for Senegalese people. There's no reason to limit what works to only things that work for Senegalese people if they stay in Senegal. And so, you know, migration is, uh, is actually one of, one of the few things that uh, almost everyone agrees, you know, whether for whatever other considerations there might be about migration, migration definitely seems to work to raise poor people's income when they move to a rich country. And in that sense, it's one of the, uh, the most effective development programs that we're aware of, but has been, you know, kind of absurdly kind of undervalued by development economists. Uh, the the uh, migration researchers and advocates, Michael Clemens and Lamp Pritchett, pointed out that 85% of all Haitians who have ever escaped poverty did so by moving to the U.S. And, you know, do we really want to take that channel away or count that as somehow illegitimate compared to developing the nation of the, the territory called Haiti? Of course, it still would be great to develop the, the territory called Haiti. We don't want to give up on that. But it certainly does should count for something that Haitians on their own have already done a lot of great work developing themselves by being able to seize opportunities to work in the U.S. And so, uh, you know, you tell the story about uh, Arthur Lewis and Albert Hirschman, who are both Nobel Prize winning economists and their early involvement in kind of kind of development. And I think I think both of them went through um, some sort of disillusionment at, at some point when they kind of observed uh a little more carefully and critically what was happening in, in the world. Do you, do you think that, do you think that, um, 
you know, every development economist kind of goes through uh, sort of a, a cycle or a phase, you know, where, you know, where you go from being young and idealistic to being, uh, you know, older and wiser and maybe a bit cynical. Is is this sort of a, a natural trajectory? Do, do we want to discourage the idealism of, of young development economists and say, you know, get, get wise from day one, or, or is, is it sort of a, a necessary phase that, that everyone has to go through? Um, you know, I don't really think of it as idealism versus cynicism. I think it's more, a more a function of the, the fact that we sort of all, we start off with, uh, a set of things that we think are sort of easy answers to development, easy answers to poverty. And then, you know, over time we realize the answers are not so easy. That's the way in which we become wise. We realize the answers are not so easy. And I think that's, you know, that really should come pretty naturally to economists. I think one of our big insights was, you know, if, if the statement is, if it, if it was so easy, then why didn't it happen already? You know, why, why, uh, if it was so easy to end poverty, then why does poverty still exist? Why didn't it already happen that poverty ended if it was so easy? And that, that I think that's like one of the most fundamental insights of economics, you know, the idea that there usually is not a lot of $20 bills for free lying on the sidewalk to pick up. If you see a lot of $20 bills on the sidewalk, they're probably fake $20 bills. And, you know, advertising something as a gimmick and not real $20 bills. Now, of course, sometimes you really do find a real $20 bill on the sidewalk and you should pick it up. But the awareness that you're not you're not likely to be able to make a living by depending on $20 bills lying for free on the sidewalk is, is part of what, you know, gives us our insight as economists that things are not, a, things cannot be that easy or else they, they would have happened already. Well, I think that, you know, some, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You, you, uh, talk about, um, how this debate began way back with, with Adam Smith, right. And his mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of debates with, with the, the, the mercantilists and how mm -hmm. the, the mercantilists really, um, you know, they had a very different approach, but was there, was there a different approach, uh, this kind of top down vision, was this actually a belief about how things were supposed to be done? Or was it really that their clients and their constituents and, and the folks that were asking them for advice were the, the rulers, right? And so um, mm -hmm. the people who are asking the World Bank for for assistance are are the rulers, right? And they're they're kind mm -hmm. of the clients mm -hmm. and, and the constituents. So so mm -hmm. you know, to the extent that you're trying to do constituent service, right? That you're trying to service mm -hmm. the people that are that are coming and 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 uh, are in a position to to work with you. Um, uh, isn't isn't that sort of what's going on here more so than, than a, a deep difference in, in approaches and a different difference in, in beliefs about how the world works? Um, you know, I think rulers, so you're right. The problem is really the development is serving development establishment and aid business is really serving the needs of the rulers rather than the needs of the citizens. And the rulers are often going to be attached to kind of some kind of prestige measure of, of that shows how, how wonderful they are as rulers. They will like, they will like the high GDP per capita numbers. They will like, you know, the prestige projects of, you know, big, big dams and, uh, you know, uh, giant interstate roads that are financed by donors that they can open with elaborate ribbon, ribbon cutting, cutting ceremonies and, but are not really you know, these white elephants, as they often wind up being, are not really consulting the citizens on with whether that's really what they wanted or not. And I think the way that's similar to what the, the debate that Adam Smith had with the mercantilists is the mercantilists, you know, were just reflecting the, the, the thoughts of the rulers that they thought the prestige item for nations is just how much uh, gold and silver the nation had in, uh, as international reserves. That was their measure of, of success. Just like today, our measure of objective success is something like GDP per capita. And Adam Smith said, no, no, you're getting that all wrong. You know, success depends on what people actually want. You know, the, the magic of the invisible hand came out of this insight that you're, the invisible hand in markets gives the individual uh, an ability to choose what they want, including sometimes they will want to send some of this gold and silver somewhere else to get something more valuable in exchange, a supply of you know, wine from Portugal or, you know, cotton from, from India or whatever. 
And you know, it's irrational to want to hold on to gold and silver as a prestige item rather than give it up for what people actually want. That was Adam Smith's insight. And so it's really the insight of like the objective indicator that is favored by the rulers and the experts as is what they think success looks like, rather than giving poor people and all people the the right to for them to say for themselves what success looks like for me, which then want, takes you to the place where what you respect above all is the choices that people make in markets, the choices that people make in democracy to say what they want and have the right to say what they want and hold the suppliers accountable to them for, for giving them what they want. Well, if you fast forward 200 years from that debate, you've got Gunnar Myrdal and Friedrich Hayek winning the Nobel Prize yeah. the same year, uh, and they gave speeches back to back, but you argue that the debate uh, never happened and that um, Myrdal was representing the mercantilists, you know, making similar arguments yeah. and, and talking about how the development yeah. has to be uh, imposed on people, whether they like it or not. And, and Hayek was, was, uh, was criticizing that, but, but you say the debate never happened. Um, is, is the debate finally happening? Um, you know, why didn't the debate happen? Why were people talking past one another? And, and have we, you know, is the debate happening now or, or, or do you think that, that we're, we're being kind of more productive in terms of hashing out these issues and, and kind of, uh, you know, resolving them? Or are we still, do we still have these two different groups talking past one another? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I don't think of it so much as talking past each other. I think it's more there's a establishment group that is, has, has won the argument enough to be the establishment to be in charge of, be the conventional wisdom and development. And then there are the critics that said the conventional wisdom is wrong. You need to do something different. You know, like, you know, authoritarian planning is not the right thing. You need, you know, free, free markets and free democracy instead. And, you know, frankly, there is no, no reason why the establishment would want to have that debate. You know, they're doing fine. They are, they are occupying the position they want of control of, of the, most of the development fields. And so why would they voluntarily want to debate anyway? And so, you know, it's often the case in many fields that the establishment has no incentive to debate with critics. And frankly, I have to admit also the critics, some of us are very, are not very skillful at persuading the establishment. We put the establishment on the defensive. They think that we're saying that they are, they're bad, that they're morally bankrupt. And so of course they don't want to listen to us if that's the way we're, we're, you know, framing our criticism. And I think we often. Oh, us critics often make that mistake that we, we don't empathize enough with the people that we're criticizing. You know, they have good reasons for, even if we think they, they've chosen the wrong, the wrong model, they have had good reasons for doing so. And we probably would have done the same thing in their place. So how can we make this debate more productive? How can we, um, is it about, uh, should we be focusing on the ends of, of development and, and try to come to, uh, more agreement on what the ends are or. Or should we continue to kind of uh, focus on kind of the, the means to those ends? Um, you know, the promotion of more decentralized decision making, the promotion of of more um, uh, feedback and accountability in, in systems. I mean, that that seems to be not inconsistent with even the ends of the development establishment, which is greater GDP per capita. Yeah, I think uh, we do have to have a discussion on the need for kind of normative normative values to guide guide development policy choices. Because obviously you you can't really make any policy decisions unless you do have some kind of welfare economics that is based on some normative principles like people's right to consent or choose. Now of course it is the the difficulty really is that, you know, normative debates are not really debates. They're not really scientific. You can't a norm is just something that you think is as good as an end in itself. If someone else doesn't think it's a good good thing as an end in itself, there's no way for you to persuade them. There's no way in which you are necessarily morally superior to them because they disagree on what is a good thing in itself. So, you know, I think there, that's a good reason why economists are kind of leery of that. But, you know, unfortunately, we can't just get, get away from the narrative dimension so easily. Because we, we, none of us are going to be happy with just saying GDP per capita is always good, even if it involves, you know, oppression or slavery or coercion. We, 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 of course, are not going to be happy with that either. So we need to have some discussion 
and what are kind of minimum normative things that we can agree on as guidelines for our, our policies. So maybe the and, most productive thing uh, would be to get... You're kind of hidden in the background, kind of buried underground without, without us opening, oh, <laughs> openly acknowledging what's, what's going on. So maybe the most productive thing would be to get people who are unaware that they have some normativity baked into their policies, make them yeah. more aware of, of the implied normativity. Because yeah. I think a lot of economists who, who claim to be non-normative, they, they don't, they don't realize that they're being normative and they might actually be a little disturbed by, by discovering that yeah. they're being normative. Yeah, I think that's right. And uh... You know, there are some dimensions in which economists are more willing to have this discussion than others. I mean, I think the inequality discussion is kind of like a lot like discussing what normative values do we want to have? Do we think greater equality is a good thing in itself? I think most of us do. And so, you know, if we place a lot of weight on that, then that's another reason we wouldn't only want to talk about GDP per capita. We'd want to talk about the distribution of GDP also. And I think that's pretty well, well accepted, but that was... That's well accepted because there is agreement on some other normative value than just higher material income. There's also, you know, normative weight placed on greater equality and that's, that's fine. So that's a good example of how that, that kind of constructive debate led to, led to healthy discussions of inequality. I think we should be able to do the same thing with discussing the issue of kind of freedom versus coercion or author, autocracy versus democracy that. We should be willing to consider that kind of people's right to choose for themselves is a good thing in and of itself. And anyone who agrees with that should be willing to incorporate that into their, their policy recommendations. Yeah. And I think most people would probably agree with that. <laughs> at least most of yeah, the I economists so. I, I know. So. Yeah. I hope so. It comes out of kind of enlightenment values that mm -hmm. we've lived with for two centuries now. Well, Bill, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. What is the thank next you, book? This, this last book was, um, you know, it was, it was a couple of years ago. Um, is there another book on the horizon? Yeah, I'm working on one now on the, the history of the development idea, kind of probing deeper into the, the long history of kind of Western thinking about developing other people, developing the rest. Well, I think you could see that uh, in embryonic form in, in your other books too. Uh, yep, you know, I, yep. I look forward to reading about W.W. W. Rostow and, and Lewis and yeah, yep. Hirschman and and Rosenstein, Radon, and all the all the other folks uh, as an as, yep. as an intellectual history that would be fascinating. Yep, yep. Well, thank you so much, Bill. Appreciate it. Oh, Hope to see you back Greg. in Berkeley sometime soon. Yeah, yeah. Take care, Greg. This is Unsiloed, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.